text this morning is going to come from John chapter 17, so if you want to turn there, you can. Uh, Gunnar and I have been with Hudson and fetching it all weekend. Allison is up with her mom, visiting her for her birthday, and I always like to talk about Allison when she's gone. Because <laughs> one of the things that usually happens in our house is, I'll put on what I'm going to wear for the day, and many times she will say no. And so I couldn't check this morning to see if this matched or not, because I don't know. So I don't, does this match? This is kind of a, thank you, this is, this is kind of a pukey green with a, with a, I don't know, and I didn't know if those two went together, and so I just wanted to be able to maybe give a good report back to Allison, you know, that, that I'm okay. But, you know, it's funny though about Allison because when she'll say no like that, and, and it's not just about my attire, there are other times she says no. And I always respond, is that your submissive side? <laughs> and she, uh, she gets a big laugh out of that. But, but Gunnar and I, we, we, uh, we notice a big difference when Allison's not around. Boy, she is uh, she's something else. We really appreciate uh, her life. I know I do, and Gunnar does, and all the boys, even Hudson, our little dog. <laughs> John chapter 17 is a uh, priestly prayer that Jesus expressed as he is moving into Passion Week. Last week we talked about the cross that Jesus died on, but also the cross that he gave each of us. Thinking about the cross, which is a big part of the Passion Week. I mean, the, it's not the biggest part. The, the biggest part is really the death, burial, and resurrection. Those three are really tied together. You can't really single one event out from the other. Next Sunday, of course, is Palm Sunday, and so we'll look a little deeper into Passion Week, and we kind of we kind of try to do on Palm Sunday, you know, a lot of things sometimes that are going on during that week, it's impossible to do, uh, and then of course you spend all of Easter on the resurrection, uh, and that kind of thing, so that's kind of a path, which is a normal path in Protestant life, and, uh, for that matter. Catholic life too, uh, as well. Uh, faithfulness is something that Paul referenced. Not, uh, it's not by John in um, in in John seventeen, but in Galatians five twenty two, the fruits uh, the fruits of the spirit. He listed faithfulness as one of those fruits. Um, also, we think of faith, and we think of faith. Fullness. We think of faith in terms of uh, our trust that we put in God. Have faith in God. We sing that song. Um, or this would be faithful. Faithful here. Faithful faith and faithfulness. Um, we also say God is faithful. Um, we can also use it of ourselves that we want to be faithful to God. Faithfulness is an exhibition uh, of our faith in God, of our, of our being faithful, if you will. The, um, the English Dictionary defines faithfulness as loyalty, dependability, a firm and unchanging attachment to a person or idea. The word assumes there will be challenges to this loyalty, the passing of time, disappointments, setbacks, even danger. But God, through the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5.22, says this is to be, at least in part, the fruit of the way we live our lives. What we like to do sometimes as we are uh, thinking about, pondering, considering, musing upon God's Word and the meaning, and its meaning, we like to illustrate it. Sometimes it kind of helps us to connect the dots. And I wanted to illustrate this idea of faithfulness, um, not only as we'll do with the life of Jesus, 
uh, most importantly, a little bit later, but with a secular guy by the name of Ernest Shackleton. Ernest Shackleton was an explorer, and uh, in 1914, he took the Endurance, and they left England to uh, hopefully go down to Antarctica and then trek all the way across Antarctica, and they were going to meet another group there who were going to have supplies and then take them down to uh, New Zealand. That was the plan. And he, uh, among 5,000 men, chose 27. Remember, our Lord, on his, in his earthly ministry, chose 12 men. Uh, one of them never knew the Lord. He never had a relationship with God. Of course, Judas Iscariot. But the other 11 uh, were his disciples. He chose these men for a certain task in their life. And there's lots of interesting thoughts about why he chose the guys that he chose, which is for another day. These 27 uh, he took with him on the endurance. It took them six months uh, to get down to um, close to their destination. However, uh, the ice pack closed in on them prior to being able, and they were pretty close uh, to getting to their destination. And so what Shackleton thought was in the springtime, which is in our fall, uh, that the ice pack would dissipate, would break up, and then they'd be able to travel again and go to their site and continue on their mission. Well, that didn't happen. When spring came, uh, the ice pack began to break up, but it broke their ship up in, in the process. And so they had to abandon their ship, and now they're sitting on the ice pack, and there's nobody coming to get them. And so, and we studied uh, Shackleton in school, and we studied him primarily for leadership. But what I wanted to suggest to you is what he did exhibited, exhibited faithfulness, not just leadership. In other words, this, this idea of loyalty, this idea of accountability and responsibility to his men. Once the ship broke up, he got his men together and he said, we have a different mission. We are discarding the mission that we had, and that's part of leadership because life has its turns. Life doesn't always go the way you think it's going to go, and it's got its hiccups, and so a good leader will make the correct adjustments. And so he said, guys, he said, we no longer have a mission to travel across Antarctica. My mission now, our mission now, is to make sure that every one of these 27 men get back home alive. And he said, that's my mission, and I hope it'll be your mission too. So he had to uh, really work on with his uh, little circle, little band of leaders that he had within the 27 about how to exactly do that. What was the best way to do that? without the loss of life, without taking too much of a great risk. And uh, the story goes that he lost a lot of sleep in that um, thought process. He was working day and night uh, trying to figure out what to do. And he came up uh, with um, uh, plan A. They worked that. It didn't work. Had to come back. Then there was plan B. They left. That didn't work. Had to come back. And then finally the ice pack... Um, uh, made plan C the only the last plan that they were going to have and it, the ice pack began to break up so much that it was unstable and they couldn't continue on with their camp anymore and so he got he let all of his men into their three lifeboats the 27 of them split up and they made a journey uh, for seven days uh, and they made it to Elephant Island 
And Elephant Island was like uh, a huge ice rock. There's nothing nice there, nothing fun there. Uh, there's no Sea World, you know, there's no uh, Disney World. It's just one big block of ice, and it's uh, not hospitable in any means of the word. Uh, but it was land, and it was the first time they had set foot on land in 456 days. So they were glad to be there. The problem was that no one knew they were there, and no one was coming to get them. Uh, there were no whaling sailing ships that went anywhere by Elephant Island. And so again, um, the mission was to save all of his men. The mission was that uh, this guy, Shackleton, was loyal. He was accountable. He was responsible. One time, uh, one of the men, uh, as they were traveling that seven days, uh, one of his men lost in the storm his mittens. Shackleton gave that guy his mittens. That was the kind of guy that he was. He did things like that all the time, and because of that, he got frostbite in his fingers. So they're on Elephant Island. What do we do now? And so Shackleton says, we can't stay here. We've got to get over here and go to South Georgia Island. South Georgia Island was an 800-mile trek. So he told his man, he said, I'm going to pick um, five guys along with myself. We're going to get in the, the smallest um, boat that we have out of the three, and we're going to make the journey over here, and we're going to get help and come back for you. And, and if I would have been there, I might have said, I've got some waterfront property for you in Arizona that I'd like to sell you, being the skeptic that I am. If they, and he brought, he brought his, his navigator, obviously, on the trip. If they missed the, uh, if they were off just, just a hair, just, just a fraction of a degree, they're going to miss that island. Well, as it turns out, they, uh, they started the journey against 20-foot seas in freezing cold water, and they could only um, use their navigator, use their navigation skills on four occurrences during the entire trip because it was cloudy the whole time. So you couldn't see the stars and you couldn't see the sun. And it took them a fortnight. Remember how we used to use that word? A fortnight, 14 days to travel that 800 miles. The problem was when they arrived at South Georgia Island, the tide was coming out during that night and it wouldn't allow them to go to the island, so they had to wait one more night out in their tattered lifeboat. The only problem with that was the next day a hurricane came whirling through South Georgia Island. And so what happened was they landed, they finally landed, they were able just barely, uh, their ship was sinking and everything, but they finally landed on a little piece of land, you know, uh, on this island. And the problem was the whaling station, the whaling city, was on the other side of the island, and the boat is not seaworthy at this point. And nobody travels over here in the sea lanes. So Shackleton uh, got two other guys, and here's what he said. We're going to travel this 36 miles across this island, and this island has mountains all over it ice and snow. It's never been charted. No one had ever gone across it before. They don't have uh, mountain climbing gear. Uh, they only had one 50-foot rope. And they used nails through the bottom soles of their feet uh, for helping them to climb. And so Shackleton took two other guys and he told these guys that were left uh, the other three guys, he said, wait here, 
we're going to travel the other side of the island, and then we're going to come back to get you. Kind of like a broken record, they might be thinking, the three left behind. And so he and the other two guys began to travel over this treacherous, um, in fact, um, in the 1950s, this other uh, explorer wanted to see what it was like for Shackleton. And so he and some other guys traveled across the island uh, where Shackleton was in the same direction and the same path, only they had mountain climbing gear and they had all their navigation stuff and all that food and everything. And he said to himself, I don't know how they did it. He said, the only way I can think of that the way they did it is because they had to. Well, sure enough, and by the way, they would travel up one of these mountains and then they would look down and go, we can't go down. It's too, you know, it, it's just the sheer drop wherever they were. And so they'd have to travel back down the mountain they just climbed up only they have to go up another mountain and maybe do that two or three times before they found the right mountain range to get through because they couldn't see well enough on the other side. Well, it took, um, it took about a day and a half and uh, the two days. They walked into the whaling camp, looked like walking dead men. And Shackleton, here's this faithfulness again, even though he was just totally spent, he gave himself one night of rest prior to making plans and provision to going around the island to get the other three guys. They got those guys, and then he had to make plans to get a ship to go back down to Elephant Island to make that 800-mile journey. That wasn't an easy task. Not everybody wanted to spend the money uh, for that. And so he had to, again, he had to work all this, this stuff up because his mission was to be loyal to his men, to be, to, uh, to be accountable to them, to be faithful to them, to make sure that none were lost. Well, they made two trips and had to turn back because, again, the, the, the ice pack began to close and they couldn't get through even though they would get so close to the island. Finally, on the third trip, they were able to anchor just off the shore of Elephant Island. I don't have a picture for you today. Uh, there is one, though, because the photographer was with them. And there's a photographer behind the guys on the beach, and they're all waving at Shackleton as he's coming in the lifeboat. He had already been there, but they're posing for it. And as Shackleton looked, on the seashore, he began to count men. One, two, three, four, until he got to the last man. And he, relieved, he was so relieved to know that not one man was lost on the expedition, that they were all saved. I want to read to you now, as we try to parallel some of these thoughts in this illustration with the priestly prayer of Jesus as he moves into Passion Week. There in John chapter 17 and verse 1, Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh so that he may give eternal life to all you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus exhibited faithfulness when he lived on the earth. How so? Verse 4 just told us. God the Father gave him a work to do, and Jesus did it. Jesus was faithful to the task of doing what the Father had asked him. And what did the Father want him to do? The Father wanted him to tell the world, the Jew first and then the Gentile, that God the Father desired a relationship with every single person on this planet. And the way to have that relationship was through him, through the Lord Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. 
I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus not only fulfilled this work that God gave him through his words and through his life and ministry, but also through the cross, through his burial, and through the resurrection and that substitutionary death that he performed for each of us and all those who believe. You see, Jesus was loyal to his Father. He was faithful to his Father. He was accountable. He was responsible to his Father. And he expressed all of that to us. That's something that ought to be exhibited in each of us and in the church today. I mean, isn't that what Paul was saying in Galatians 5.22? The fruits of the Spirit, you remember them, love, joy, love, and joy, and peace. He goes on down and he says, faithfulness, loyalty, responsibility, accountability. We all ought to have those kinds of things. Today, we don't see a lot of that. And we could probably say that in every age, because people are people. But people have trouble being loyal when tough times come around. Sometimes people have tough or difficult time being loyal when trouble comes, when pain comes, when sickness comes. I was reading this week where a, the, a pastor at his church, at a large church, hired a guy to interview many of the people in his church. And uh, so the um, statistician asked uh, the people in the church, said, do you like the church? Do you like the church you're a member of, the church you're attending? And many of them said, oh, yeah, we love it. So, well, why do you love it? Well, we rock out with the music. And the sermons are relevant. And our kids love coming here. And so he would then ask each one of them, he would say, well, what if the pastor left and the sermons weren't relevant anymore? And what if they didn't rock out in the music anymore? And what if your kids went, ah, I'm not really too sure about all this? And many of them said, we would leave immediately. Well, I just am curious of those folks of who they're accountable to, who they're responsible to, who they're loyal to. In other words, many people in our churches today, they, they're here or they're coming or maybe they're involved as long as you are fulfilling their felt needs. Well, I'm telling you, there weren't too many felt needs during Passion Week for Jesus. <laughs> it was a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble, a lot of dis. I mean, the disciples all left him. I mean, these were the guys who were, who were his friends. He'd been hanging around with for three months, eating with and, and working with and teaching them. I mean, he'd been teaching them for three years. And what was the result of that? They all split, man, the first, at the first crack of trouble. And many people in our churches today are like that because they're loyal to their own self-interest. Everybody understand that? As opposed to being loyal to the Lord. Now, what's interesting about John chapter 17 in this priestly prayer that Jesus is going to talk about. Like, in fact, let's go ahead and read verse 6. I have revealed to you, I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 8 and 9. Because the words that you gave me, I have given them, and they have received them, and have I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. Here's a, yeah, known for certain that I came from you. 
they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. Now, here's the interesting thing about this loyalty thing, this faithfulness. And I've, I've spoken to you about this before, but I'm just going to, I don't know that you, you could hear this too much. A good thing happened when the printing press came around. People eventually started getting copies of the New Testament for themselves, particularly in the Old Testament too. By the way, every verse in the New Testament is from the Old Testament. So it's all intertwined. It was a good thing. They, started, they were able to read God's Word on their own. But a shift changed when that happened. Then it became my relationship with God. It became, I'm going to do this thing we call Christianity in my bedroom, on my own, in my living room. It wasn't that way for centuries prior to the printing press. You see, because there were very few copies. So for you to listen to the Word of God, it was an event called community. You didn't go home and have your quiet time. Now, you would pray, certainly. You would do that on your own. But you didn't have a text to take with you. And so, and you, and as a Christian, you hungered for God's Word. And so what would you do? You would be mixing. You would be rubbing elbows. You would be all in there with all the other believers. And y'all would be listening to the Word of God together. And every time you heard the Word of God, you were with the community of faith. And as you heard what God had to say through the Word, since your, uh, your entire understanding of church was community, you always thought in those terms. When you heard God give directives in the New Testament about the way, about the way a Christian should live and about what a Christian should do, you always thought of in relationship to your brothers and sisters around you. That changed in the modern world. That's the world that we just passed. We are now in a post-modern world, which is a whole nother paradigm. So my point, though, is, is that you cannot exhibit faithfulness to God without being faithful to your brothers and sisters. The community of faith. S listen to what Jesus is saying in John chapter 17. I've got these 11 guys, and I haven't lost one of them. Now, they, they split for a, you know, for a little few days, okay? But they came back. And Jesus brought them back, and Jesus forgave them, and Jesus restored them, and Jesus used them. What they all, I think, became martyrs from what we understand in church history, except for John. They all gave their life. Some of them in horrible, well, they were all horrible ways. I mean, so man, I mean, they, they did the deal. Jesus said, I didn't lose. See, see, Jesus, in this earthly ministry that he had, this in exhibiting this faithfulness to his father it also see that you know have you ever thought about the cross the, the the relationship that goes the vertical relationship that we have to the lord but you can't just have a cross with just that one board you got to have this cross you got to have this board you got to have this direction that's what first john 1 7 says if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another in the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all sin. In other words, the faithfulness, the correlation between the faithfulness that you have with God is directly proportional to the faithfulness that you have to your brothers and sisters, the community of faith. In other words, when God puts you in a particular part of the body of Christ, 
Maybe he put you here. Maybe you're looking. Maybe he put you somewhere else. You're just, you're just visiting today. Wherever that place is, and there is a place that he had. Whatever home church he put you in in the first century, right? Whatever cave he put you in in the first century, wherever he put you in the church, God wants you to exhibit faithfulness not just to him, but to his body, to his church. This is what Jesus is talking about, how he was faithful in this effort. And he's going to say later on in this chapter, not only was he praying for those 11, but even the ones to come who would put their faith in God through the Son. That would be you and me. He was praying for us that we would be one, that we would exhibit this faithfulness in the community that we have. So what does that mean? What does that faithfulness in the community of faith look like? Well, we are doing a good thing this morning. We are reading the Word of God, and we're talking about it, and we're doing it what? Together. Together. Now, we're not saying, oh, don't take your Bible home anymore and don't study. Oh, no, but do that a bunch. Do it every day, right? But God never intended for you to be an island. God intended for you to work within his body. Because, you know, for example, in Galatians, uh, what is it, 6, bear one another's burdens. Remember that verse? And so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, we'll have people in the body and they've got such a burden They can't bear it on their own, and they need help. They need you, or they need me, to come alongside and go, I know it's too heavy for you. Let me just lift it up. Hey, George, could you come over? Yeah, yeah, let me come over. Oh, man, I can't. Hey, Susie, could you come over? Yeah, come on. We'll get it up there for you. It's okay. And so then your brother or your sister goes, oh, God, I can take a breather, man. Thanks so much. I felt like I was just fixing to go under. Now, that's what faithfulness looks like. When Jesus, when he developed this relationship with the disciples, it cost him time. It cost him sleep. And this is where the parallel breaks down between him and Shackleton. And unlike Shackleton, it cost him his life. He made himself vulnerable. You see, and that's where a lot of folks, they go, no, I'm not ready for that. There was a little couple that was getting married, and the preacher said he got to the part where he said in sickness and in health, you know, rich, riches and poverty and all that. And they said, hey, we're, we're we're not buying into that part. That, that, that sounds too morbid, okay? In other words, we just want the ice cream. We don't want the vegetables. And so, no, faithfulness is you, when you're involved in the community of faith, you do become vulnerable. Just listening to folks' problems makes you vulnerable because you have to sit there and work through this problem that's not yours and that's their problem, and trying to do what? Help them. Shore that burden. This faithfulness and community is about giving, not just of money, but of time. Sometimes it'll cost you some sleep. Jesus, in this relationship, as he developed it, he served these guys. He taught them he worked with them, and he had fun with them, too. They, I mean, they were on a three-year camp out, man. Had their little travel, travel trailer they pulled around, you know? They, were, they, they had some good times, and they laughed, but they also cried. That's part of it. And at the end of the three years, yes, they, they did go AWOL. but they came back. 
Is there anybody here today that's been AWOL? MIA? You know, it's hard. It's hard to provoke one another to love and good works, as the writer of Hebrews challenged us, directed us, if you're not meeting in the community. Wherever God has put you, God wants you to be faithful. And you can't claim faithfulness to God. Hear me now. If you're not faithful to his body, to the brothers and sisters that he's put around you. It's not just about this. It's also about that. Let's pray. So you may want to pray this morning and in the the days following that God would help you to become more sensitive to the areas you need to become more faithful. Not just in your personal relationship with God, but certainly that, but also in your relationship with His church. That's a worthy goal. That's a worthy mission. You see, because as Jesus didn't leave anybody behind, so you don't want to do that either. Maybe there's a little girl or a little boy or a young person or a young man or a young woman or a middle-aged or a senior citizen that needs your help. Think about it. Pray about it. Think about your loyalty. Where does it reside?